You're listening to Lighting Up Real Estate with your host, Kendall Lockett. I love when brands reach out to me because they want to sponsor the podcast. If you've been listening to the show, you know that I'm a book lover. For this episode, I am super excited to be working with ICRA Publishing Company. They help listeners like you become self-published authors. With one-on-one guidance and support, ICRA Publishing helps you design, edit, and publish your book into an ebook or printed in soft or hard cover. Sell your book on Amazon.com and other platforms and keep 100% ownership rights and royalties for your work. ICRA Publishing has four different publishing packages available, and they're customized to meet your needs and goals for your book. With ICRA Publishing, becoming an author has never been easier. If your goal in 2021 is to become an expert in your field or share your story to inspire others, I have a solution. Transform your thoughts into a well-written, beautifully designed, high-quality book. Go to ICRAPublishing.com and use promo code CANDLE and get 20% off your package today. Episode 24, How Investing in Real Estate Can Close the Racial Wealth Gap. The goal of this show is to shine a light on people, strategies, systems, and ideas to help you get started in real estate investing. If you've been inside the new app Clubhouse and have gone into any real estate room, you are familiar with my guest, Brittany Rose also known as Be The Boss on Instagram. She is Clubhouse famous, y'all, for simply being herself and helping everyone that reaches out to her get into real estate investing. I asked her to be on the podcast to discuss her personal mission to close the racial wealth gap in the U.S. Brittany drops a trail of gems through strategies, steps, advice, and goal-setting ideas in this interview that all lead back to one thing, mindset development. This is a different conversation. It's not about numbers of flips or where to find properties or even hard money lending. This conversation is about what we must be, do, and have in order to create wealth. Another great episode. Let's get started. Brittany, welcome to Lighting Up Real Estate. Thank you, Candle. I'm so excited to be here and I appreciate you having me as your guest. Oh, wow. This is an honor to have you here. You are, in my eyes, Clubhouse Famous. (laughs) You, <laughs> when I tell you, you are definitely living out your purpose in Clubhouse because you are just giving and giving and giving every, and I mean, every opportunity that you can on real estate, you are making sure that we are getting the information to go forward and building wealth through real estate. Yeah, that's super important to me. And I really appreciate you saying that because whenever we're in there, I'm always quick to say I'm not an expert, right? But I just want to make sure that everybody gets as much information as they can and then that they're actionable with it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay, let's just go from the beginning. Like, how did you even get started in real estate? I've actually been in and around real estate pretty much all my life. So my my mom was a realtor. She worked for a new homes builder. And then as soon as I got to be 18, I started working for some new home builders. And then I jumped into a marketing position with a new homes builder. And that, it was all very part time. But just being around it and being exposed to it, having grown up in Loudoun County where there's nothing but new homes almost. It was just really natural for me. So I always loved real estate. I always really enjoyed it, but it wasn't my first company. I had started building a cheerleading company in college. And when I moved back home, I had spent a little time back working in this marketing position for a Ford developer. And then I ran into a partner and we decided to jump in completely blind (laughs) to flipping houses. And that's kind of how it all got started. Wow. That, okay. That's a lot right there. And so I'm going to, we're going to start with at 18, you got into real estate. I kind of feel like you were living out the book, rich dad, poor dad. It just came to mind when you were telling, saying that. So were you able to see firsthand and learn, I guess, from your mother, like how real estate can actually build wealth for anybody? My mom met my stepdad when she went back to college. They ended up, you know, getting together and moving out to Loudoun and buying their first house. And so ownership was always very normal for me. 
So, and it was just like a small townhouse and we moved all the way out. Like Loudoun County was the country. Like Walmart, we, we just had gotten a Walmart and it was like the biggest deal, right? There's no movie theater. There was no mall. There was no, there's no nothing. There's this, these little shops downtown. That was it. So we moved all the way out here so that my parents could be homeowners. And when it happened, I wasn't very excited about it. But looking back, I completely understand why they did it, why it was important. And so from there, you know, we just kind of my, my dad was a firefighter. My mom was a realtor or worked for a new home builder. It's a little bit nuanced, but we just kind of were typical middle class people and just like saved up for the next house and in yada yada. And then when the real estate boom happened, my mom was in real estate and, and greatly benefited from being in real estate during that time. And they bought a second home as an investment property and the market crashed. And so everything went haywire and it was really, really tough. So my experience with investing was pretty much like, oh, you have to save a bunch of money and get a second, a second property or, or what have you. I had no idea how many opportunities existed beyond just buying and selling homes traditionally. But my mom is very entrepreneurial and has a very entrepreneurial mindset. So I think she passed a lot of that on to me. So even though their first foray into investing wasn't successful they never passed on any of that like doubt or fear or baggage to me they were always just like okay well we'll go again next time you know they they were those types of people okay so then you decided you're just gonna blind faith do your first flip yes and i don't encourage it it was okay. so bad okay so let's learn from that what lessons did you you get from that first flip Oh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> the first lesson is choose your partner wisely. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So tell us the backstory. You got with a partner where you guys doing a 50, 50 split half in like one person paying the down payment, the other person doing the work. How did you guys syndicate? So your first deal? of all, we didn't, we didn't have any of these details laid out. When okay. Started. He started first and I was like, you know, I can help you with this. First of all, so it, this was not my company. The first flip was not my flip. Actually, none of them were actually my flips. I was mm -hmm. helping. And because we were also in a relationship, it was kind of like, let me just help out and you know, every everybody wins. Like, you know, how yeah. do you want to see them be successful and you're willing right. to help out in whatever capacity. So he had started flipping and he had some like handyman experience, yada, yada. But I felt like he was smart enough to get it done. And he was, he was mm -hmm. smart enough to get it done. But there is a difference between being smart enough and being smart enough to know what you don't know. Oh, yeah. And so like... You know, you can be a, an incredibly smart person, but if you're not able to humble yourself and follow directions and follow advice and like really do things the right way, you know, it's a train wet wreck waiting to happen. So he had started and then I was like, you know, I could help with this. Like there's some, you know, I'm, I'm good at marketing. I'm good at administration. Like I can help. And so I started helping and chaos ensued. <laughs> <Basically>. <laughs> Did you try to take over? What happened? I tried and I, <laughs> I tried to take over. It did not work out, but it was just, it was everything that could go wrong went wrong down to the freaking house being haunted, like <laughs> legit haunted. I mean, I could not make this up. It was horrible. Wow. It was horrible. And what made it even worse is the problem was compounded because mm -hmm. We felt like, oh, this is this is successful, like we're making it. And then an investor came along and was like, oh, well, you know, let's work together. And then we're like, another oh. investor came. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. And we're like, oh, great. We have an investor like we could do more deals. <laughs> this is great. Right. Not realizing how much stuff it was from like the, the jump. And then I got the bright idea like, you know what? I'm so good at marketing. I'm going to start social media. I'm going to market all this stuff that we're doing. 
And then other people started coming and being like, hey, I want to, you know, get involved with what you're doing. And so I was like, oh, great. Now we have more investors. And like, you know, I raised all this money and just literally handed it over. And again, like, oh my gosh. no sense, just no sense, no, no equity in the company, no business wow. agreement, like nothing and no decision making power, no access to financials, right? Like just, and, and it was, nothing was done out of malice or ill intent, you know, mm-hmm. like everything was done with good intentions, but you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right, and right. exactly where it went, <laughs> everything went to hell. Wow. So I learned literally everything not to do. And Mm -hmm. now I'm just happy to pass that information along and help people not make the same mistakes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So did you end up selling the house or what happened to that property? Okay. So first of all, we over rehabbed the property. So it took longer than it needed to take. It was more expensive than it needed to be. Ran into like we didn't have enough construction experience and we didn't have good enough contractors to, you know, I think it's really important yeah. that if you're going to work with contractors that aren't like 100 percent amazing, that you at least have the background to know what good work looks like and what it doesn't. Yeah. So it just so we ended up moving into the house because we <sighs> okay. were out of money. And so we moved into the house. And that's kind of when we really started to experience some of the like paranormal activity that was happening. And it actually made me really sick. It made it it gave me extreme kidney pain. And I've never had kidney pain before. Mm -hmm. I never had it after I asked the neighbors about the water. I didn't drink any of the water. Like I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And after extensive research on the man who used to live in the house and built the house and all of that stuff, we found out that he died of kidney failure. And I was like, oh no. Oh, so we wow. had to, like spiritually cleansed, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And um, the night after we had it cleansed or the night we had it cleansed, right? We went to sleep and we both had the same dream of being attacked by spirits. And I was like, I'm done. I Time to go. <laughs> But you got to figure this one out. Yeah. So I, so I, I honestly, by the time, by the time everything kind of summed up between he and I, Mm -hmm. I was so far removed that I don't actually know what happened. Like, I'm not even, I'm not a hundred percent sure what the end result was. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure it ended up getting sold, but I was just like, whatever has to happen has to happen. But yeah. <laughs> I cannot stay here. Wow. That is a story. But the end of that story that is so great about this is that your why was so much bigger. Because most people are like, I'm done with real estate. I will never touch it again. And you're like, I'm telling everybody and their mama about real estate investing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so true. It's so true. But like we were, I mean, we were talking offline. It's about mindset, right? And I think we get a lot of that from my parents because my parents could have said, oh, you know, the crash happened and we lost our property. Yeah, We're never going back, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't. And that's, and I feel like that really has resonated with me. Like I'll never just lay down and quit, you know, like we have so much life ahead of us, hopefully, prayerfully, right? There's time. There's time and anything can be fixed in time. So I really had to go back, talk with investors, even though that money didn't come to me, even though it wasn't my company, you know, I went back and made it right because it's my brand, it's my reputation, it's, and you know, I chose to participate. So I really had to go back and and take accountability for it, whether whether I was legally accountable or not, Mm -hmm. right? I had to take accountability for my decisions. And so that's, you know. Yeah, that says a lot about how investors should run their business. It should be based on, like you said, it's our brand. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're behind our name. That's all we have to stand on. A hundred percent. And I'll say like, it's a, it took a long time. Like, you know, I will be paying people back for a long time. But I've realized that once you unblock those relationships, those like past issues, when you go back and you face it and you clean it up, your life just becomes so much more blessed and abundant. 
And yeah. so I'm not I'm not worried about it. You know, okay. like it's fine. Like I'm 100 percent confident that this will this or something better will manifest. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I love talking to investors, because our stories are so amazing. Like this is like the dopest conversation. It's never boring. <laughs> never boring. And we always have our own journey, which is just, I think the coolest part, but we're like, we're not, we took that lesson and we made it into a stepping stone yeah. and we keep moving. And then we're having people come behind us. So it's, it's like, okay, yeah, that happened, but we learn from it. We keep it moving. Cause we know at the end of the day in our efforts to close the racial wealth gap is what you are doing daily. Yes. And so you, really, I think when you when you make it about the greater good, mm-hmm. your small lessons, <laughs> challenges, yeah. whatever, pales in the comparison to mm-hmm. what you're here to accomplish. Yeah. This is yeah. Just a very tiny and a, a, just like and, and you think about the billions, trillions of dollars in real estate, like whatever you got going on is not that big of a deal. And uh, <laughs> and uh, most people, most really like, you know, the people we all look to, the major real estate moguls, mm-hmm. th- at some point they've lost. And they've lost a lot bigger, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so if you can't handle the small loss, you're yeah. not ready for the big gain. Yeah, which is going back to that why. It has to be so big because yeah. you're going to have to lose to get the lesson out of it. A hundred percent. There's this way. Just like you were saying about your partner, like he knew enough, but he he knew only so much to get him so far. He still had to get a lesson out of this, no matter how much he thought he knew. So yeah, yeah there, there's just no way. There's no way that you can just go un- un- into this unscathed. Like, oh my gosh, this was effortless. No, it was not. <laughs> like, <laughs> this was the easiest deal. No, it wasn't. Tell the truth. <laughs> Save the devil. You're lying. <laughs> But you know, that that even comes down, I, I would say I'm blessed with a horrible memory. Yeah. Because it's like childbirth, right? Like you experience this super traumatic wow. experience, right? Yes. And you still get up and do it again, right? Exactly. That's and a so- beautiful baby. <laughs> this is my child. Exactly. That's the best way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you have to just take what, take the lesson mm-hmm. and let go of the rest. And so yes. I forget stuff all the time and people be like, oh, don't you remember this? Or don't you? I'm like, no. <laughs> find the receipts. I'm the yes. same way. Yeah. Like, yes. can you find a receipt? It didn't happen. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That is exactly it. And it, but it keeps me happy. It makes mm-hmm. me happy. And when you can be happy, you can overcome challenges so much easier. You yeah. can manifest so much abundance and love and, and good things in your life when you're yeah. not stuck dwelling on whatever happened in the past and you're not worried about whatever's going to happen in the future. Mm, that's, that's the key to happiness. Yep. It's just hundred percent getting this present is the best and dopest thing ever. I want to just put it in a box and sell it to everybody. Like yes. that. <laughs> it's in the present. <laughs> just enjoy it. Enjoy where you are right now. Yes, yes. Okay, so Brittany, I have to ask you, we have to have this important conversation because I want it our message and this conversation that we're having, of course, to serve a purpose, which is in to close this racial wealth gap that we have going on. We are two so very like-minded people. The minute I saw you on Clubhouse and you literally said in your bio, flat out black and white, my purpose is to eradicate and close this racial wealth gap. I knew that I found like my like-minded sister, like, yes, like she has it there, black and white. And she is actually doing it every single day. I come in the Clubhouse, Brittany is dropping those jewels. What happened in your life or in your journey in real estate investing that made you realize this is what your calling was in your life work? So it's only actually been a a couple of months maybe that I've been that I pushed myself into saying that publicly and putting that at the forefront of my my social media profiles and et cetera. But I've I think I've known for a really long time. I've always had a heart for people, but especially black people because of all of the generations of challenges and struggles and the things that still continue 
right? And I just believe that we deserve to live the lives that everybody else deserves to live, right? And so for me, it was, I started a a notebook a couple years ago, and it was my goal book. And so I... I say every day, it doesn't happen every day, but like every so often I just go through and I write my five-year goals and it's just a constant reminder. And what I started to realize when I was trying to get really clear about exactly what my purpose was, was that most of those goals centered around the elevation of the black community. You know, eventually I want to start a a school system and not just a school, but a school system, right? Because I think our education system is incredibly broken and that there's so much work to do there that honestly, it might just, it might just work out better to start your own. But creating that, creating more business owners, creating more businesses, creating more opportunities, particularly for kids to travel, to explore, to just like reach a higher level in terms of mindset. Just like all of those things, all of the things that I was writing down that were that were outside of financial goals were dedicated to the elevation of Black people. And so I was like, well, <laughs> if I had to sum up all of that in, in one sentence, it's the wealth gap. Like, like that is everything attributes to that. That is like the glaring statistic number. Like it is black and white. Either you hit it or you didn't. And that's like the definition of a good goal, right? So it couldn't be I want to elevate black people, or I want to, or, or even I just want to start a school, right? Like that wasn't clear enough, but this is measurable. It's actionable. I think it's something that everyone should be able to get behind, right? Like nobody should walk around and be like, oh, nah, I I have a problem with you (laughs) eradicating the wealth gap, right? Like it's just saying that everybody deserves the same opportunities. Every, Every, And that statistic is a clear, glaring headline that things are not fair. They're not equal. They're not equitable. They're not the same. It's still unbelievable. Like when you hear those, like I love to watch CNBC and they, especially when it gets to the real estate housing market, I just like, I'm just there like, okay, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? And when they say like, oh yeah, we had historic highs and more homes have been sold in 2020 than since the 1970s. And then you look at the real demographics and then you see that blacks are at the very bottom. And it's like, how is that possible when we're the, the largest minority? Like, what are we doing? So yeah. Because we have generational trauma to overcome before we can ever get to overcoming financial, right, trauma. And there's a lot of systematic things that have happened and still happen that has really created these inequities. And so I know and believe that as a people, like none of that, like it matters, but it's not going to hold us back. And that's kind of what we've seen throughout our entire history. And so, you know, there there are a lot of people on the ground doing the work in all of those different areas. And my job as providing actionable items and providing um, support and connection from the first time homeowner who is buying a $50,000 house to the multi-million dollar developer who wants to stop gentrification and his neighborhood, right? So for me, I just feel like I want to serve at every level, but I know that I it can't just be like a, a one-man band. So I have to be a connector. I have to put people in position and give them the resources. And, so, and a lot of times what I do is just like life coaching, like encouraging people, supporting people, helping them break down their goals, making it actionable, because we have two two very large subsets of people. We have the people who just need to get into owning something, and we have the people who are like really killing it, the, the real estate moguls, right? But both of those ne- subsets need to be successful for us all to win. And so there's so many connections, there's so many opportunities to help people move forward and win individually. And then by everyone winning individually, we win as a collective. Yeah. Yeah. That is so true. So, I mean, wow. 
I just knew this conversation was going to be amazing. <laughs> this, because I mean, it, it's so often, it's very rare that I get to have conversations like this. And whenever I do get in a room or, you know, virtually with someone, it's, it's very enlightening because you get it. You get it. And, and it's something that, you know, like you go in there and you're preaching every chance you get in Clubhouse. And I feel like, like you said, it's like all feet have to be on the ground. Everybody has to be doing something to help with this. So what do you think is like that misconception? Like, like you said, it is systematic. And I definitely agree with that. This is a, some stuff that we've got going on. And we're like, what do we even start with? identifying the problem and then working through the problem to get to the solution of us owning real estate and then being normalized. Um, oh, that's yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's twofold. One is just like 10 toes down dedication, choosing that no matter what happens, no matter what is set before us, that this is something that we're going to do. And every person has to make that decision for themselves. And then on the other side, it's the acknowledgement of the historical inequities that have existed. And what I think holds people back is they feel like acknowledging it makes them complicit in it. And that's Whoa. not inclusive, right? Like those things don't necessarily coincide. So yeah, this happened. Some of these things happened generations ago. Some of these things are happening right now. We can just acknowledge that it's happening. So many things open up and we can say, hey, I understand that this is a problem and I might not be actively making it a problem, but just being able to acknowledge it helps us move forward. I think that's really the first step. Like everybody has to stop acting like it's not happening just because they're not specifically doing it. <laughs> like, that's it. That is it. Like, oh, I have my house, you know, but it's like, but your cousin doesn't have a house. Right. So that it's not okay, you know? <laughs> it's not okay. And it's also being authentic, right? Like, who did you have to become to move yourself forward? And who do you have to show up as in the lives of the people that you love to help inspire them to move forward? We were just talking on Clubhouse a second ago, and there's this narrative around like, oh, people are going to be haters and people are going to, you know, flash your team and stuff like that. And I'm like, but who do you have to be for them to be comfortable doing that? To yes. You? Yeah. Right. Like, who do you have to be attracting, allowing and what energy do you have to be giving off for people to even think to come out of their mouths with craziness to you? I, 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 I honestly don't remember very many conversations where someone has been like, no, you can't do that or has doubted me. Like I, I, I probably remember one conversation and in, in it's, I can't even remember. I can only really relate to the feeling. I think we talked about this earlier. I don't remember things very well, but I remember feelings. And so my dad and I were having a conversation. He's very conservative, like work, was in the military, retired from the military, was in the fire department, retired from the fire department, was in the school system, retired from the school system. Like he is an employee through and through, right? Like that is, that is who he is. And so for him to see me be so entrepreneurial is, is sometimes a bit of a struggle. But we got real clear about, about who I am, what I'm doing, what I'm capable of. Like I am never going and, – and I'm very respectful to my parents. So I don't want to make it sound like I just be going off on my parents or anything like that. But like I will tell you really quick, like why can't I do that? Who said I can't do that? That person did it. Why wouldn't I be able to do it? Right? Like, and so over the course of those conversations, my dad actually opened himself up to entrepreneurship. Right? So like, he's always wanted a restaurant and this franchise opportunity came in front of him. And you know, he, I, I feel like after watching me build my first business for so long and having all those conversations, 
he allowed himself to take the risk to be an entrepreneur as well. And so that's, those are the, that, that's what I mean about who do you have to show up as to make sure that everybody around you elevates themselves. If you're, if your mindset isn't strong enough for you, it can't be strong enough for anybody else. And so that, I think that's a major, major thing. That's, that's one of the things like I, I never advocate taking responsibility for other people, but I, I also am very in line with like, I'm my sister's keeper. I'm my brother's keeper. Right. So there's a balance that has to happen, but I mean, it doesn't cost you anything to have a positive mindset. No, it, it's free. It's free. It's free. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely free. Believe me, it's free. You could be happy for no reason and it costs nothing. Yes. <laughs> for no reason. I'm happy because I'm alive. Exactly. That's it. Girl, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. yes. And I think that, that that is so true. Everything that you've said. Because when you're in that situation, because I, I ask a lot of my guests, like, what mindset did it take you to get here? And a lot of them have said, it took me having to not listen to my family members mm-hmm. or, or, or prove them wrong. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I've been in the situation before in relationships where I had to tell guys that I was dating, like, hey, this isn't going to work because you're not going to talk me out of this deal. You know, right. And I, we just, hey, we parted ways. It just wasn't meant. But then I could, like, my theory was I can show you better than I can tell you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, let me be quiet. Since God has given me this vision, this dream or whatever project he has put me in, let me do it because that's between me and him anyway. I don't have to prove it to you what I've got to do. I just carry it out. Yeah. And I'm like, well, let me show you how I did it. You know? And then people come back around and they're yes. like, Because I watched you do this, I went and did this. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just, I would say, and a lot of people ask me all the time, like, while we're talking about this, like, what what is one one thing that you should do when you start investing? And I I always say, you have to surround yourself with other like-minded people. Absolutely. Because I remember when I was super young and I had properties, I didn't surround myself with any other investors. And I had people around me that... We're nowhere near the mindset that I needed to have to have what I had created. And I didn't even realize the key component was who I was surrounding myself and who I was listening to. Mm-hmm. And I think that is, I mean, it's great that you can have your friends and your family and love them and you can have all kinds of conversations, but some conversations you just can't have with them. Absolutely. And just because you love them doesn't mean you have to be around them all the time. <laughs> I love my family. My family is so low key. Like I honestly have the best family. We don't have no drama, no craziness. Like it's just all love. And you know that you can pick up the phone and I have a very blended family, right? Cause I mentioned before my stepdad, well, I have my stepdad and his side of the family. And then I have my stepsister and her side of the family. And then I have my mom's side and my dad's side. So I have a very, very blended family. And I know that if something goes wrong, I can pick up the phone and call anybody and they got me. But on a day to day basis, nobody's in my business. You know, (laughs) everybody's just allowing everyone to like live their lives and do their thing. And so I don't need to to be with anybody every single day that's not actively pursuing the same thing that I'm trying to pursue. I just like it just. I need to be having these conversations about creative real estate techniques and what's happening in the market and what what are our goals and where are we going? Those are the conversations that really motivate me and encourage me. And so you have to know that for yourself and you have to understand when it when enough is enough, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So what are the misconceptions about wealth? Let's start there. Like for anybody that's listening, thinking, oh, why should I even own a house? Or why should I invest in real estate? Like what, and we get this all the time, but I want to get, you know, your viewpoint on like, what, what is the disconnect to where we think we shouldn't have it when it's the actual, it's a lie. We need to have it. I think the biggest misconception is that wealth equates to rich, right? Like they're not the same things. You don't need a limbo to be wealthy, 
right? <laughs> like the goal of being wealthy is to be self-sufficient. So like if you decide that you don't want to be working anymore, you don't have to work anymore because you've built something that produces income, whether or not you go to a job every single day or not. And I'll also say that another misconception is that once you've attained wealth, that you don't have to maintain wealth, right? Like you still have to maintain it. You still have to do something, right? But you just have so much more freedom and you can pass it on to the next generation. It can be built upon, right? So I think those are the the biggest misconceptions. Like we have to continue to maintain it. You have to build it because there's a great quote and it's like, if you're not growing, you're dying. If you're not growing your wealth, it is diminishing because that's how things work in the world. So I think those are the kind of like the key things that we all have to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if we're not growing, we're dying. We need to be intentionally going out, getting around like-minded people, getting uncomfortable. Mm. That's a part of the growing process is that we have to get uncomfortable and start getting into Clubhouse, going into those real estate investing rooms, start learning, start writing and understanding why this is so important because like this is multi-generational wealth. And it, it's like that it still goes back to me in that normalizing. Because if I can't, it feels uncomfortable to me if I'm having a conversation with you, Brittany, and we're talking about real estate investing and we're talking about the housing market and our goals. But then as soon as we hang up and then I go over to a friend's house and they're talking about, I'm thinking about getting another lease on my apartment complex. It's just something's not right. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And I'll, I'll also say, like, I'm not against renting. I'm yeah. a very transient person. So, like, I actually am very supportive of renting. Uh, not only am I transient, I'm entrepreneurial. So it makes it a lot more difficult to be a typical homeowner, right? But that doesn't mean I, do, I, I don't acquire <laughs> property, right? And so, like, I think a lot of uh, one big mis conception about ownership is like it has to be your house and I'm not saying it has to be your house it has to be, anybody can live in that house you just, you just own it you control it right and I think that's the important distinction like if, if you enjoy renting cool rent like that is okay but that doesn't excuse you from your obligation to oh, for you and your future generations. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, because we have to have ownership. Like, and you said that so on point, it doesn't excuse you. We've got to start getting the ownership in. Because I mean, I, I agree with you about the renting. It's because I, when I started real estate sales, I did not, I jumped out full, full steam ahead going like full time into being a real estate agent. And I literally rented out my house because I knew starting out a real estate agent, I would not be able to pay the mortgage. But I'm like, but there's somebody out there that can. So exactly. I rented it out and I moved in with, this is my strategy. I was like, God, this is what I want to do. Let's do this. He was like, well, move in with your girlfriend. She's having issues. She was a teacher. She wasn't having financial issues. We were still doing the furlough in the school system because after, you know, after the, the housing market crash, a lot of the school systems in Georgia were being furloughed for like four or five, six years. And she wow. was like, girl, I'm behind on my goal and my strategy. I'm supposed to be doing, you know, having this much left to pay in my mortgage and I'm nowhere near it. And I'm like, well, let's solve a problem together. I don't right. want to pay a lot <laughs> for a mortgage. You want help paying down your mortgage. This could be a win-win for both of us. So I moved in with her and it worked out. I literally became her tenant. But I still had that house. So it was just still kind of like, I'm not going to, like, I can e easily adjust myself to do the entrepreneur side, which I needed to do to sacrifice to make it work. But at the same time, it was still the ownership. And I still tell people like, yeah, you don't have to even be in the state. If you see a house in Alabama that's $40,000, let's buy it. I can help you get a tenant in there. I know realtors down there. They need houses. They're available. Let's start making a stream of income. And then it's like that other conversation, like, really? Yes, you can do that. We just don't talk about it. Exactly. And you said something really important, sacrifice. Like, what are you willing yeah. to give up in the short term to win in the long term? And yeah. not 
And when we think about people, uh, and that's why it, it all goes back to your why, right? Like you were saying, if your why is big enough, you understand that you might have to sacrifice for a year, for two years, for five years, so that everyone who comes behind you can be set up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay, what do you think is the best real estate strategy right now? If someone is listening to this and they own zero real estate, what do you think is like, what steps should they do or consider to figure out what they should do first? Whew. So actually, it's funny that you asked that because I've been really thinking about putting together like an introduction to real estate programs so that people can really understand all the options there are and figure out what works best for them. Yeah. What I would recommend is wholesaling with creative financing. And I say that because it gives you all of the sales skills that you need to be really successful in real estate. And it also gives you an opportunity to really add as many tools as you can to your toolbox to not only solve problems for people, but also to acquire property for very little or no money. Um, owner financing, subject to financing. Subject to is, is a little bit more of a, of a nuanced thing. And I think you should really study and educate yourself before jumping into that. But owner financing is a win for everybody, right? You can't get better terms than zero down, zero interest, <laughs> you know? Yes. So, um, yeah. the, and those deals are possible. And, and it'll also teach you like the mindset. You have to go through so many no's to get to that yes. You know? But when you really dedicate yourself to the action and not the outcome, those don't matter. It's fine. It's not a big deal, right? You just keep going. And, you know, being in so many of the, these real estate rooms, you know, I find people having really big goals. And I have really big goals, obviously. But I get nervous that if they don't attain those goals, they'll quit. So I really think that we have to put more emphasis on the journey and the learning process and the activity over, I'm going to get this deal tomorrow, right? I mean, it costs nothing to drive for dollars. It costs very little to buy a list. It costs nothing to call people, you know? So like, even if you're starting off with just a bicycle and a phone, get do the activity so that you can get better at it and that, that you're making progress towards a goal. I mean, I just... I, I think wholesaling has such a low barrier to entry in that respect. And to be successful at it, you really have to like really level up who you are. Uh, I think it's such a good place to start. But if you have, I will say the other place to start is if, if you can house hack, that is even better than wholesaling. If you're an employee. The best. <laughs> the best. So yes. I am. And, and people don't really understand that you can house hack something that you rent. Right. Like get your landlord on board and rent out something probably better than you would normally be able to afford on your own or rent out something that's really inexpensive and get a roommate, rent out the basement, rent out the extra room. You know, like I've heard of people in their garages so that they could rent out everything in their house and put all their money into real estate. Like it's really about how uncomfortable you're willing to get. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that one. Girl, we are so light-minded <laughs> in so many ways. Cause, and it's so crazy because I'm not doing a shameless plug or anything, but I, I literally created a course exactly what you were talking about. Because it's like, if you just jump into something, like, let me introduce this, let me introduce that. Because like you said, they have the big goal, but it's like, they can't. I think what I realized in my mind when I created my course was because I saw an immediate shutdown. They would say, or I would get emails like, hey, I want to have a... 36 unit apartment complex. Okay, you can get it. But then they couldn't, they would shut down the minute they used to have to start from the very beginning. And I've been saying from the very beginning, y'all, it just starts with your first house. Every real estate agent, or I mean, real estate investor, they start with their very first house. That's all you got to do is just take it and you build it and you grow from it. And you go from here, then you go to there, and then you have your apartment complex. Like, I, and it's just, it, I don't know, it's, everything you said was just so on point. And I just know that 
we could definitely get anybody can reach any goal, but we just don't. It doesn't happen overnight. I think I always have to tell myself, Candle, you eat Absolutely. the elephant one bite at a time. You can't eat the elephant. And that's hard for all of us. Like all of our ambitious personalities, like it is. Hey, that's hard, but you're right. And and sometimes you don't even, and that's what staying present will do for you, right? Because one day you look up and you're like, oh, wow, I'm here now, you know? Like a year ago, I, I never thought I was going to dig myself out of that situation with that first property. And then, you know, one day I looked up and I was like, wow, I'm on talking about real estate, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's how it starts. Cause I mean, yeah. Cause and that's what I love about talking to investors. Cause it always starts with that one property and it turns from this. I mean, I've never heard anybody on my, my podcast talk about how the first property they did was a haunted house. I mean, it, and then you're still going out every single day talking about the benefits of owning real estate and investing in it. So, I mean, everybody, we have to have a story, but we, like you said, the excuses have to be over with. Like we, ha- and it's so much information out there. Like you're creating a course. I have a course. You're on clubhouse every single day. The information is here. Absolutely. You just have to take action. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now I got to get to this financially lit segment. This is the part where I don't have a school system for you, but I do have a classroom <laughs> that I do offer <laughs> to my guests. <laughs> and it's called financially lit. And this is where I love to just talk about money because I think that is also another misconception is that we think that we have to have so much money. You were just talking about, you know, financing where we don't have to pay anything out of our pocket. So, I mean, there's the misconception that we have to have so much money, so much money, but also at the same time when much is given, much is required. We're still in a minute in a pandemic. And every time I keep saying in the middle, every time on my podcast, we're in the middle. No. it's like we're never getting to the end of this thing. <laughs> so, so we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And, you know, they talk about, especially on CNBC, about money. Like, you know, so many thousands of households are, you know, or without money or don't have $500 in their savings to get them out of an emergency situation. So, you know, we still have to be responsible with our money because we don't know, you know, what could happen. So I like to have this segment just to talk about money because it, it goes along with the real estate investing. Like you got to have yeah. both. <laughs> So this is where I let you take over and I'm just going to ask you some questions and you can be as short with it or long with it as you like. But first question is like, what is the mindset? Because you mentioned the mindset, you know, of your mom being an entrepreneur. What is the mindset that you think an entrepreneur Hmm. should have? I think, and this is what I learned from my first company. I had to make a decision that no matter what, I was going to keep going. That if you can get that down, everything else is easy. Like No matter what happens, if this is what I want to do, it's what I'm going to do. And I, and I don't need to know how. Yeah. I don't need to have a game plan necessarily. It's great if I can have a game plan, but t- chances are it's not going to work that way. Um, but yeah, it's just, you have to keep going. You have to just get up every day and put one foot in front of the other and look for that, that next step. And if you can do that, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So what financial book changed the game for you? Oh, you know, everybody's first book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. (laughs) And I think I wrote, read that in high school. Um, So really, and again, my mom, my mom found it. And then, you know, I would scour their bookshelves. to. to You read Rich Dad, Poor Dad in high school. I did. Oh, I'm so jealous. I'm so (laughs) jealous. So it immediately was like, oh, no, I'm never going to get a a job. I've never had a job. I've worked part time, you know, for years while I was building my business. But that's not true. I tried to get a full time job. One time when all, when everything was kind of like crashing and burning around me, I was like, OK, I'm going to I'm going to try this this full time job thing. And I actually ended up getting a marketing job at a real estate office. So the two things I love. Right. You would have thought it was going to be perfect. Yeah. So miserable. It lasted three weeks. <laughs> it was done. <laughs> three weeks and it was over. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> I just got to make this work. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And so what was the mindset that you had to have? It was just like, I know I've got to 
like create a schedule every single day, make yourself accountable, responsible? Like, what did you do? Oh, that's good. Um, So I've recently come to this place of honoring my ebb and flow. And so not pressuring myself to necessarily fit in a schedule. Like, yes, I do have a really rigorous schedule. I have on my phone, like I have some some days I'm taking 10 phone calls a day. Like it it can be a lot. Um, But in general, I try to keep it very loose. There's two days a week that I'm actually, well, now one day a week. Uh, Yeah, so about three hours, maybe a week where I'm actually at my gym because I still own the cheerleading gym just like checking in and there are a couple of clients that I've had for a while and that I love teaching so I teach them one-on-one and so that's really the only thing in my schedule that doesn't change but everything else is like oh I'm in Baltimore today looking at properties or oh I you know am on clubhouse all day today and I'm laying in the bed and working. (laughs) So I've really gotten into this place of, of not forcing myself into a schedule because it doesn't make me happy. And when I'm not happy, it's much more difficult to, to like manifest the things that I want in my life. Oh my gosh. And I think that's contrary. Oh, I just love that answer. A lot of people don't, think that way I'm glad that you do because Mm -hmm. a lot of people are like you have to have the 6 a.m miracle morning and like bruh if I don't feel like getting up at 6 a.m I'm not getting up at 6 a.m like I just don't (laughs) understand that good for me and some and and because it's good for me there are a lot of mornings that I'll probably do it right but yeah I don't I don't want to force myself into things it, that's just not what works for me. And I also noticed like that type of advice tends to come from men and men work differently than women they do. do. They do. We do. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I just love that answer. I think it, that's something that we, I love these conversations. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad we're talking <laughs> because I, I realized too, I had to hire a life coach and yeah. she definitely made me realize that in a short sense of the word, I'm not crazy. Because I realized that I was forcing myself to do like that basic, you got to be doing this by nine o'clock a.m. And then you got to be doing this by 10 a.m. And I was trying to force myself. I I can't remember what I was working on, but I was literally just miserable, utterly miserable. And I texted her and I said, hey, something's not right. I just feel horrible. And she was like, well, why are you doing it? Yes. (laughs) And I thought about point, that. <laughs> the whole point is for you to be happy. Yes. We're that we're going to do a whole bunch of stuff that makes us unhappy to get happy. Like what? <laughs> yeah. And she just said, then stop doing it. And just yeah. like that, I closed it up. I think I took a shower, danced around the house, got happy again. And then it was like, this is okay. Dancing is under, underrated. It is so, un- girl, what? Yes, it's very <laughs> underrated. You need yeah. to get your energy up, get your mindset right. I have a playlist mm-hmm. and it's like, it has a curse word in it, but it's like, be a blank boss, right? <laughs> yes. So whenever I'm feeling like discouraged or upset or just not 100%, I put that on, I dance around, I relax, and then I'm like, okay, yeah. I can go back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think like Megan is my my playlist. I always start off like yes. I don't want to say the person's name because they're in the office and they'll start playing the music right now while we're recording, but it's that little <laughs> gadget that you get from Amazon, you know, that does everything. And we'll just start off the day with that. And then it's just like I'm at my best self. Yes. Literally. And it's like, okay, if you don't do it, just give yourself grace. And that's what I've been doing this year too, considering with everything going on. It's like, Candle, give yourself some grace. It's okay. And then when I'm in it, I'm all the way in it, like 100% present. And it's amazing when the outcome is. But when I'm not, it's okay. It's okay. That is so awesome, Brittany. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So I love to hear this answer from you because you've grown up in the real estate background. What was the best lesson that you learned about money and wealth that you didn't learn in the classroom? Uh, First of all, I didn't learn anything in the classroom. (laughs) (laughs) Let's be clear. <laughs> uh, that was an utter waste of time, but okay. Um, 
<laughs> what, but what was the best money lesson that I learned? Yeah. That nothing is as bad as you think it is. Mm. I mean, there's always there. I feel like, you know, we make mistakes or we have failures and we're, we feel like it's like the end of the world. And it's not. And yeah. I also realized how easy it is to make money. It's really not that hard. Yeah. We make it way harder than it needs to be. I I don't know. I just, it would have been really easy for me to look at the large sum of money that I owed to investors and been like, oh, I can never do this. Right. Mm-hmm. I can never recover from this. But then I was like, actually, this probably isn't that difficult. You make a plan you get everybody on the same page. You make a small commitment that you're going to pay over time. And then you pay more. And then it just gets smaller and smaller. Like, yeah. I will say when I was in college, I got my first credit card. And they gave me a crazy limit. Mm-hmm. And I spent it. Especially because, you know, at that time, it, the recession was happening. I really didn't want to be asking my parents for money. I wasn't working that much. It was like when I first, I was, I was like a sophomore. And so I, I, I charged everything to this card. And then next thing you know, I was in all of this debt. And I was like, oh my God, this is, ir- this is, I, I'm never going to get out of this. This is going to take forever. And now I'm looking at that card like, <laughs> like that was a drop in the bucket. That was wow compared to the numbers that I, I'm working in now, right? And yeah. So we always feel like whatever challenge we have is so huge until we level up and realize, and, and we keep adding those zeros every time we go to another level, and we're just, and then you look back and you're like, oh, that was nothing. Yeah, I love that. You just level up. Yeah. That's it. I feel like you need to have like some type of um, life coaching, zen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're definitely there. Your vibe is definitely so chill. Yeah. It's no it's no need to get worked up about stuff anymore. I'm just it no. Work out. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What would you describe COVID in one word? Blessing. Love that. And I know, and, so, and a part of me feels or has felt very conflicted about what a blessing it has been for me Mm -hmm. when I see so much loss for others. Yeah. But I had to acknowledge that it's part of a journey for everyone. Yeah. And that everything that appears negative isn't always negative in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so I can't be, I can't, I can't put my sadness on them because I don't know what blessing it's going to become for them over time. And I also had to stop looking at the loss of life as a negative, because if you, depending on, you know, what religion you are, what religious beliefs you have, if you believe that there is an afterlife and that it's better than the one that we're in, we exactly. Might be sad about people going there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I had to get. I had to definitely shift my mindset on some of that. But honestly, it made me stop and stop doing things I didn't want to be doing to begin with. But I had gotten yeah. consumed with in the in the everyday grinding hamster wheel, right? And just sit down. And it was the first time in my life I had ever just sat down, (laughs) number one. And then once I sat down, I started to realize where I was, what I wanted to be doing, what I didn't want want to be doing, and how I could pivot. And, um, and, And God just blessed me with a lot of financial resources to help me make Mm -hmm. that transition. But it like I don't I don't know that I would have ever gotten to get to this new level without the pandemic. I agree. I agree. I, everything you said, just you know, it's that was a mic drop for me. And it's every guest because I started the podcast during the camp the, in the middle of the pandemic, and everybody's like, "This has been a blessing." Like yeah. I can't. 
like we feel bad, of course, for, you know, the lives that have been lost and the families that are grieving. And of course, for the everybody in the healthcare, the frontline workers um, and their protection and peace right now. But this has just been like, it's just like, God, are you serious? Like, what else are you going to do? Like, it's just been like, like, I just wake up every morning, like excited. Yes. And it's like something is about to happen. Amazing today. God, okay, I can't wait to see what it is. Okay, what is it? What is it? You know, and it's like in every day I've been like that. And I love that. I love you saying that because I think that's something we need to be very intentional about, like waking up and being excited about all the possibilities of blessings that could come to us. Yeah. Yeah. I have this affirmation I'll share with you. Um, I awake in anticipation of wonder excited about the wonderful, miraculous things that God is going to do for me, with me, and through me on this day. Mm, I love that. Can you send that to me? I love that. I will. I will definitely. I will send it to you. Yeah. And every day I wake up with that, just anticipation. Like like this morning, I literally was just so excited. I got up. I listened to uh, T.D. Jakes. And yeah. then I was literally like, oh, my God, I'm talking to Brittany in like five minutes. Oh, God, this is like already. It's only 12 o'clock. I mean, it was just like, really, Kim? I'm like, yes, really. Like, this is it's already lit. It's 12 o'clock. I mean, <laughs> and it's just this happiness. And it's like, I can do this. Like, I and that's what he preached about, ironically, today was you have the right to be happy. Yeah. And then I was like oh my gosh, did he really just say this is not crazy? He's like, no, girl, go for it. Scream, shout, be happy. You have earned it. And I'm like, okay, let's do this. So yeah, a hundred percent. And so that's just like, okay, going forward, I I just choose to be happy. I've earned it. We've all earned it. (laughs) Like you've made a choice and that I think that's over. Like people don't make you happy. Circumstances don't make you happy. There are people with far less than what we have that are just as happy because they choose to be happy. They choose to to live their lives with gratitude. And that is what makes you happy. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because one thing he said, which stood out to me at the beginning of the sermon, I knew it was going to be lit. The minute he said this, he said, God, I already thank you for the wealth because once I have it within, it will come on the outside. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be on. And it was. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, the happiness has to come within. Once you have that happiness on the inside, everything else, it, it'll show up. It'll show up. Okay, so what are your goals for 2021? Whew. Okay. <sighs> mm. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm doing this thing. I'm I'm reading 12 week a year. Um yes. so I'm trying to like really buckle down to doing like quarter really aggressive quarters. Yeah. So I want to do another rehab this quarter. I want to get my first Airbnb listing. I want to regrow my cheer company because we're only operating at like 20% because of COVID. Mm-hmm. We can't right. have large programs. And I'm not trying to be responsible for nobody's grandmother getting sick. So yeah. I, I'm going to follow the rules <laughs> and then just develop my consulting practice. So I'm a real estate consultant. But I haven't systemized everything that I want to systemize. And Mm -hmm. so I primarily work with out-of-town investors to kind of like help them go through the entire process of of investing in Baltimore. And so I just want to get that a little bit. I want to get my processes and systems down a little bit more because I'm not a believer in self-employment. Like we can all call ourselves business owners, but in reality, most of us are self-employed. And if you are tied to a job or your company doesn't run without you, then you're, you're self-employed. And there's nothing wrong with that. Wow. It's just not what I'm trying to do. So getting my systems right and building mm-hmm. a really strong team will put me into that that business owner category. And that's really where yeah. I want to be. So that's my oh, corner. I love this. Yes. And you know, it's so funny you just said that because I found I was looking for my 12 hour my 12 week book. I have that. And if I was looking at my, when you were saying that, I was like, okay, where's that book? Cause I have it. But I also have, and I found this last night and I was like, going to look at this. It was the four hour work week. Yes. Oh, I need to listen to that again. That was, that's probably the second book that I read. That was like a complete mindset shift. 
Yeah. And I I started and I stopped. And I'm like, Candle, get through this whole book this year. Can we just do it next week? Uh, so <laughs> I'll make that, like the systems, like you really said something like about the systems and self. You were talking to me, girl, because I definitely said, I don't know where I had, I think it was an ego saying, you've got to have your hands on everything. Mm. But, you know, the ego is nothing good at all. And it's like, no. Everybody can run itself. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I have a team. So why do I feel like I have to have my hands on everything? If I'm three people, then they better be able to run itself. Like that. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it's not nothing to come do your job. Yeah. Yeah. It's been nothing but ego of, oh, no, you have to have your hand in everything. You've got to oversee this. You've got to write this. You've got to create that. And it's like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I'm I'm so glad you just you you are really teaching me right now. <laughs> sign checks. That's the only thing that I I really oh, have to do. I love it. You are yeah, you're teaching right now for real. You are talking to this girl here. <laughs> you don't talk to anybody. I needed to hear that. You you've already you just already blessing people with that one right there, girl. And don't get I, and I don't want to like I don't want to hype it because there are still times and moments where I'm like, okay, I have to get in and do this or transform that. Yeah. You know, you're still the driving force behind your business. But yeah. I, one of my goals is to be able to franchise my cheer company, and so I can't franchise something that can't run without me, right? So like, exactly. you have to you have to be clear on what it is that's that's important to you and what your yeah. goals are in that. Yeah, I love that. So what do you predict about the real estate in 2021? Huh, it's, I'm so bad at predictions, but. I don't want to, this is for the fun of it. Hey, we, nobody predicted COVID. I'm so right. I'm just saying, you really can't go wrong with it. Right? Right. I was <laughs> definitely about to like p- publicly tell people like, oh yeah, it's probably just hype, right? And then I decided not to say that and thank God, because it has not been hype. It hasn't, yeah. <laughs> so I think that there are, well, with the Biden Harris administration, I think there's going to be a lot of support for people to be able to stay in their homes. And with the market having so little inventory, I think it's going to be mm-hmm. a great opportunity for people who can flip because there's just not yeah. enough inventory on the market. And there's definitely mm-hmm. not enough inventory for people who want nice homes. And it doesn't matter what income bracket you're in, you want a nice home. You want I a pretty HGTV house like that is, mm-hmm. this is what it is. So that's what I, I think that if we see a large amount of forbearance, foreclosure type of situations, I think that it's going to be really quickly absorbed back into the market, either from investors mm-hmm. buying it up or from homeowners buying people's houses. I mean, there's just not, with the interest rates this slow, we're seeing a lot of demand. And I think it also Mm -hmm. depends on what area you're in, right? I'm in the DC market and that market is very different from Baltimore. Like the demand is just not quite as vigorous in Baltimore as it is in DC. So it depends on what market you're Mm -hmm. living in. I do, from being a part of Clubhouse Conversations, I've been picking up that the migration patterns for our nation are going south. And so I think a lot of places, Miami, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, especially Arizona, those places are going to see really big leaps in growth um, in the the near future. I know personally, I'm tired of the cold. If I listen, I don't have nothing I have to be here for. (laughs) So, (laughs) <laughs> so come on down to Atlanta, girl. Right. Heck yeah. Yeah. That's, we are blue now. Yeah. So come on. <laughs> right. Um, I'm, I'm, I might be down there in a couple of weeks. I didn't realize you were in Atlanta, but we'll have to connect. Yeah, it is uh, Georgia. And I've been saying it. I've been watching it. I love to study the market and the numbers of land ownership. I remember before COVID, I, it was in the thousands. Like it was over... I can't remember off the top of my head, but like 2,500 listings for land for less than 5,000. Wow. Now it's like 78. Wow. <laughs> Literally. And I had kept saying in social media, y'all got to buy land, buy land, buy land, buy land. And then finally, when Rick Ross purchased, I think a million dollars worth of land, people started listening to me. Like I kept saying, 
by land, by the land. It's something about this land in Georgia y'all are sleeping on, by this land. Yep. So yeah, and then and now with it being blue, it's, it's extremely competitive now because everybody's coming here. Right. Like millions, billions of dollars was put in those campaigns for a reason. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, you are. You're definitely. I think your prediction was very accurate. I think you did very good with that answer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so if you could give four steps to financial freedom, what would those four steps be? Decrease your expenses. I have so many mm-hmm. friends and family that are paying crazy amounts of money on just car payments. Like stop that, (laughs) stop it now. (laughs) So decreasing your expenses, a house hack, you know, get a less expensive car. I'll tell you in full transparency, I I blew the engine of my car because I'm really, really bad with cars. I'm really rough with cars. Mm -hmm. Blew the engine of my car right when COVID started. And I was going to go out and get a new car. But then I was like, I'm about to be locked in the house. Like, I'm not about to be paying for a car. Like, I'm not doing that. So so my company has several vans that we go pick up our kids in. And so Uh it was like, you know what? I'm just about to drive this bus around. And that's what I've been doing. Because then then I started thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? I really, I don't want just any car. I want a Tesla. And I don't want Mm -hmm. to buy it necessarily. I want to lease it because a lot of my my driving, my mileage, everything is for my company. If I'm going somewhere, I'm I'm going for my company. I'm driving an hour and a half on a regular basis to Baltimore for investing, right? So it doesn't it makes more sense for that to be a company vehicle. And so I was like, you know what? When the pandemic ends and I have a goal credit score, I have like my, you know my next goal up for my credit score. And so I was like, when I get my credit score and the pandemic ends, I'm going to just go ahead and and lease my Tesla. And so until then, I am driving whatever is free for me to drive because I'm not spending my money on something I don't even want. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it, it takes... I mean, I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars I, I've been able to put into investing because I'm not paying a car payment. Yeah, yeah. I love that answer. So, that, so what is your ultimate goal um, for your life? My ultimate goal is to make a difference for Black people around the world, right? Not just here in our country, not just in any specific country, but to actually move the needle worldwide. And I don't know what that looks like yet. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the answer is not just to, I don't think there's enough money to do it, right? It has to be about shifting education and mindset global scale. I don't think anybody has enough money to throw out that problem to just make it all of a sudden magically fixed. There's there's just too many underlying causes to the issues that we see. So it's really going to be a mindset shift. So that's probably like my ultimate goal. My five-year goal is to acquire $50 million in real estate and businesses. Love. And so, and that's really because, that's really like a vanity goal. It's just because I want to do it, right? <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's vanity. I didn't see that as vanity. I well, I mean, there's just there. Uh, I, I that might be the wrong word, but it's yeah. like I wanted something that would push me, that would challenge me, and so that's what I picked. I think God planted that seed in you for a reason. Mm. Maybe to show others that it can be done. Facts, but and it's not far from vanity. It's not that. It's not vanity. Yeah, that you just didn't throw that out there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. There's no coincidences. Yeah. Yeah. There's none. So yeah. other so wait, I didn't answer all of your questions. So <laughs> four steps to being financially free. So yeah, cut your expenses, increase your income. So start a business, start multiple businesses. I have multiple businesses. I run a marketing company, I have my cheer company, I have the restaurant and food truck with my parents, and then I have a my my business as a realtor and my business as an investor. So, and the only way that you can be able to do that is once you get one business down, you get a team and you outsource 
and you like I don't I, I I try not to be at the helm of anything. I try to have a team or at least a really good partner that can help move the needle forward even when my full attention isn't on it. So that's what I would say is number two. Okay. Why are you thinking about the thought? I got to interject this. This was so amazing what you just said. You said one, the multiple streams of income, we need to get the business down and the goal is to outsource it. Yep. I love that. I love that. That is something that we don't hear because we want to say, oh, we own a business, we own a business, but we've got to, out- that's the ultimate goal is we have to outsource yep. it. And you, ha- you have that. to find a business that you can keep quality around, right? And, and so, mm-hmm. so sometimes you have high touch businesses. I have a high touch business, right? And so I know mm-hmm. that I have to put the right people, I have to source the right people, I have to find the right people. And that's been incredibly difficult. But I understand that that is the nature of that business. And that is what I have to do for that business to run independently. Whereas Mm -hmm. like if you sell a product, you know, that's much easier to outsource. So so sometimes it's not all about creating businesses around what you love or what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just learning to run Facebook ads and and you know, learning how to create a successful e-commerce store and outsourcing it to a drop shipping company. Like sometimes that's what it looks like. So not getting so caught up in the weeds and really keeping, keeping first thing first. And so, and, and sometimes we, we magnify what a business has to be. I saw this TikTok video the other day, this boy makes Mm -hmm. like a thousand dollars a day stenciling house numbers onto the curbs for his neighbors. How easy is that? Like you get some spray paint and some numbers from Home Depot. You knock on a door and say, hey, do you want your yes, numbers? I saw him. You did. I know who you're Yes. Because it started out when it wasn't like a, a football theme or he couldn't go to the football game or something like that. Oh, I or maybe I only saw the TikTok video. So I don't he probably did like hmm. a more extensive video, but. Maybe it was another boy and his father. This was when it was related to a football team. Like they started spraying the football logos into the grass oh, or something like that's that. That's a great idea. Yeah. And he got paid. I like one neighbor said, I want this one. I want that one. And him and his brother just went around spray painting these themes. So, okay, let's see now. That's a new one too with the numbers. So easy. Yeah, so easy. <laughs> and a lot of that, like yeah. a lot of great business ideas because we, we live mm-hmm. in the age of social media Honestly, if you're watching content like that, your feed becomes more content like that. And you start these yeah. really easy business ideas that you can do. And you yeah. don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like there's plenty of people online talking about very low barrier to entry businesses. Mm-hmm. So that's the second yeah. thing. So lower your expenses, increase your income, be financially literate. And so, like, understand what is possible, like, especially in terms of real estate, what can you do? What have other people done? I think that's really important. And then four is protect your assets. There are not enough with insurance, insurance, life insurance policies. You know, we don't have our properties in LLCs. You know, we don't know about land trusts, like, you know, all of those types of things. So educate. Yeah. 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 I think that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a whole nother podcast. Interview. It definitely <laughs> is. And I'm always learning yeah. about it because the information is not mainstream at all. Yeah. I think that. Yeah. I was in a, a clubhouse room last night, probably about to one o'clock in the morning with Dan Loke. And I'm a big fan of him and his videos on YouTube. And he was just answering question after question. But it was something that was so profound was that he said to, um, I can't remember what the question was, but Brittany, he was literally telling us how to run the business. Like if you go from like zero to $1 million, you need to be focusing on nothing but marketing. Then you get to this point. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's dropping these jewels. And he said from like, and once you get to 1 million and plus this is, and you mentioned it, I don't think you even realized you said it. But you mentioned how when you have a a business, you need to have a partner with you that sees your vision. Mm -hmm. And he literally said last night, you you are one has to be the visionary, but then you have to hire someone to carry out, to continuously integrate, to put the action in all the things that you want to do. They do a hundred percent. 
Oh because my, I would oh tell you, God. I am not I'm not detail oriented and I'm not yeah. the implementer. I can tell you how to mm-hmm. do it. I can craft the vision. I can tell you how to overcome almost any obstacle. And if I can't, I will go learn how. But am mm-hmm. I going to sit at a desk and do it? Absolutely not. You know? <laughs> and I just had to come to a yeah. place uh, where I I recognized that and accepted that about myself. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. Yeah. So I'm probably not going to. <laughs> so like, we all yeah. need to be real, yeah. real with ourselves about that. Because yeah. most entrepreneurs yeah. are visionaries and we don't do that. Anymore. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and it's ironic because when he said it, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm the integrator. Mm. Because it's like, if God gives me something, he'll give me the vision because I'm not the visionary. And then I'm like, okay, done. Bet. It'll be done by the end of the day, God. And it's done. I mean, it's just the coolest thing ever, but I've just never been. I was like, okay, so if I do, you know, partner with someone that has that vision, I would definitely be that. I'm the integrator for sure. And that's what is so funny because it scares my mom. She was like, I always, always, since I've known you as a child, if I tell you to do something or you get this idea, you just run and it's done. You don't even think about it. And I'm like, is that a bad thing? You know? No, it's a blessing. And she was like, it just scares me. <laughs> that was her answer. It just scares me. Like, you just do it. And I'm like, well. <laughs> I wish I had that because I'll be like, uh, first of all, I get so many ideas and so many things that I mm-hmm. want to do. And all of it works to a common goal. So I feel like that's okay. But, you know, it might take me a couple weeks or months or years to circle back around to that mm-hmm. other thing that I wanted to do, you know, so far, far ago, you know, so that's yeah. a definite blessing. See, well, it, it's a good and the bad. The the thing is, like when when I create something and I when I get it done, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do with it? Because it really wasn't type my vision. It was just like, okay, and I'm like, okay, God, what did you want me to do with this thing again? It's here. <laughs> What am I, you know, and I'll, I'll be sitting on things like I've been sitting on books. I've been sitting on courses that are just created, but I'm still like, okay, God, um, it's here. I'm waiting, you know, literally. And that's the downfall with it. Well, listen, <laughs> we'll talk offline because I know what to do. Yes. I'm just not going to create it. I can tell you what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could definitely work together on some things. <laughs> Yes, but how can we find you, especially in the clubhouse on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever else you want us to find yes, you? Yes, well, definitely on Clubhouse, um, Brittany Rose, and you can search. I guess my handle is be the boss. It's just the letter B as in Brittany, and then the boss. Um, and my Instagram handle is very similar. It's B dot the boss. And yeah, I mean Instagram is great because there's a link in my bio and it really has Mm -hmm. a ton of resources. It has everything that is going on and a million ways to connect. I actually have free like office hours, so to speak. So people can schedule sessions with me and just chat for free so that everybody's kind of getting pushed in the, in the direction that they need to get. I will say like, I don't know when this is going to air, but it is currently mid January. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm booked out into April right now. That's awesome. Well, we're going to put the link on the website that will always be there. So if they have to wait until August to get to you, we're going to give them instant access to you because yeah, you are the business. (laughs) That is for sure. That's amazing. (laughs) And like you can, and I will say that there are different types. So that's just like the free session, whatever, whatever. But if you're looking to buy a house, if you need hard money, or if you need like more specific coaching help, those appointments are available much sooner okay okay and we'll have a link on the your web page on lining up real estate.com so anybody that's listening just go to the website get to britney's page and it will be there and get in touch with her because she is so serious she is the <laughs> boss <laughs> that is for sure and you have been such a light today this has been the the really the dopest conversation uh, i've had so much fun talking yeah. to you we're definitely gonna have to yeah. like talk on a regular basis Yes, yes. And you've got to come back. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. To learn more about Brittany and to get her contact information, just go to our website, lightinguprealestate.com. If you like this interview, subscribe, leave a review, and share this episode with someone that needs to hear it. That's all for now. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay lit.